Hello, and welcome to my first online dance workshop. I suspect that many of you that find your way to this recording will already have run across me. But just in case, my name is Rodri Davis, and I'm a caller based in the UK. As you can tell from my shaggy appearance, this is being recorded during the COVID-19 lockdown. This year I was booked for four of the big dance festivals in the UK to run dances and workshops on a variety of styles and subjects. All four of those events have now been postponed, though some are intending to run some kind of online event. And that got me thinking about the kinds of dance workshops that could be run online and whether there were some workshops that might be better online than live. So I've had this idea of taking a look at how those of us involved in folk dancing write down our dances and share them in written form and use that in our performances. So this is a quick workshop on dance notation. It's aimed at dancers who have never tried reading a dance off a page or never got the hang of it, or for people who are beginning calling. If you're a practiced caller, then I expect you're already going to know all of this already. And to be clear, I'm talking about the kind of dances that we do at folk dance clubs and festivals. So Cayley dances, English country dance, contras, squares, Scottish, Welsh, Irish, the kind of things done in sets made up of a sequence of figures. So if the objective is to capture a dance into written form, what do we need to include? I think you need the sequence of moves. That's the main objective. You need to have a note of the number of dancers you expect and the formation they should be in. You should have an idea of how the moves fit to the music. You'll want the title, that's what identifies the dance. You may want some indication of particularly hard bits of the dance or tips on style. Uh, there may be some unusual moves that you need to explain. You might want to record the choreographer that wrote it or the source that you collected it from. There may be some information about the context of the dance, its history, um, who it was dedicated to. And there may also be things like uh, suitable tunes or recordings to dance it to. Exactly how we write things down depends on the precise objective. If I'm producing the notes for myself, for something that I'm going to use on stage, then I want something that I can understand quickly. I want it to be brief. Um, I'm going to use a bunch of abbreviations and I'm going to lay it out in a standard format on, uh, so that I can fit it onto something small that I can have easily to hand. I'm not going to explain a lot of detail about things that I know and I understand well. It's there as an aid memoir, not a precise description for somebody who doesn't know the dance at all. If I were to produce something for more general consumption, um, so to publish on a website or in a book, then I'd use better formed English and I'd provide more complete explanations. So what does all that look like? Well, um, here are my call boxes. They're full of the cards that I use to call dances from. And if we look at one of those cards, um, they look something like this. Please excuse the writing. Um, I acknowledge it's not pretty. My two excuses for that is that I am a doctor. You really can trust me. And the point is that so long as I can read it, it's achieved its purpose. So let me show you the way I choose to format my cards. So here's an example. And let's start with the layout. In the middle is the sequence of figures and an indication of the timing. I've got the title, the number of people, and the formation at the top. The notes are self-explanatory. On the back, uh, the length and the type of the music, there are suggested tunes because sometimes the dance was written with a particular tune in mind, or I may have found a tune that fits the dance particularly well, at which point it's well worth making a note of it. And then down at the bottom, a record of the source that I got it from. In this case, I wrote the dance, but it might have been a book that I read it in, or it might have been from another caller, in which case I think it's nice to record that as well and allow you to give appropriate credit. 
So let's look at it in a bit more detail. The title's important. It's the identifier for the dance, and it's so much nicer than just giving it a number. Then there's the formation. I've used an abbreviation. LDI stands for long ways duple improper, and that implies the number of people, as many as choose to get up or will fit in the hall, and that it's the first couple that's improper. I've specifically noted it as a contra. I have a lot of long ways dances in my call boxes, some that I expect to dance in the style of a contra, some are more of an English country dance. If I'm doing a quick look through the call box to find something suitable, I find it helpful to have it explicitly called out as I'm looking through. Now onto the sequence and the timing. It's pretty terse. So in this card, it just says patronella, patronella, balance and swing, do -si do neighbor, do -si do partner, star left, star right. Very terse, really, but all the information's there. And so long as the notation is something that you understand, that's really all you need. I've used abbreviations for neighbor and partner. I've used an asterisk for the star. You can write it out in whatever way works for you. If I'm using this on stage, I don't have time to read through a lot, so I need it to be brief. Another thing that I've done here is to include after the move in brackets some hints. The kinds of things that help me be clear about the dance, things that I can emphasize during the walkthrough and maybe drop into the prompt during the dance as well. Things like who you're going to be doing the move with, your partner or your neighbor, which way you end up facing. Most of the time that's obvious and I wouldn't bother noting it, but sometimes it is worth including just to be clear. I don't have an example on this card, but if you saw one of my other cards with things underlined in colored pens or boxes drawn around them, then those are the kinds of things that experience tells me that I either get wrong during the walkthrough or that dancers commonly misunderstand. So they're things that it's worth me emphasizing. Then there's the timing, how the moves fit to the music. I choose to notate it in terms of the musical phrase, the A and B music and the repeats, A1 and A2. And then beyond that, the bar number within each phrase. So in this dance, bars one to four of the A1 phrase are a patronella. So are bars five to eight. And then all eight bars of the A2 are balance and swing. I could have written that down separately uh, as the balance with the timing and the swing with the timing, but I choose not to. You could write down the patronellas as A1, one to eight patronella twice. It would mean exactly the same thing. It's just a matter of whatever's clearest to you. Now you can figure out the total length of the music from this notation. It's 32 bars but I choose to write that down explicitly on the back of the card. And with that, I note the type of the music, jigs, reels, hornpipes, rants, or a particular set piece of music, and so on. And really, that's it. There's an awful lot of information that you can pack onto an index card. So you might ask, why have I chosen to write this format? Well, it's largely because this is the way that the people who I learned calling from wrote out their cards. And when they loaned me their cards to help me get started on my repertoire, I copied the way that they did things. I've added my own little nuances to it, like using colors and the particular abbreviations I use. And as I've done more and more calling, I think I've got a little more terse in the way I write things out. I don't need as much explanation. But fundamentally, the way that I do it is the way that I learnt it from some of my mentors. So the next obvious question is, why did they choose to do it that way? Well, you can go back to their mentors and so on, but I think it fundamentally comes down to history. This is basically the standard house style used by the English Folk Dance and Song Society, EFTIS. If you look at some of their publications, like the community dance manuals, this is the kind of notation that they use. It's marginally more verbose than the way that I write things out, but it's basically the same thing. You might ask, where did Eftis get that from? Well, if you go back a stage, this is one of Cecil Sharp's country dance books. And basically, 
it's what he did in these books. Again, he's a little bit more verbose, but remember he was aiming at a readership who didn't have as much of a background in this style of dancing, um, who are perhaps meeting the dance for the first time on the page, rather than using it as a reminder of something that they'd done with somebody teaching them. So more explanation was appropriate. So the obvious question is where did Sharp get it from? And I suspect he invented some of the ways of laying it out with A's and B's and the number of bars. Um, but don't forget that Sharp had been doing some research into the dance manuals from the 1600, like John Playford's English Country Dancing Master of 1651. And if we look inside, uh, in this case, my facsimile of it, and we look at the first dance, which is called Upon a Summer's Day, you'll see something rather familiar. We have the title, we have the sequence of moves, we have the formation. And if you know how to read this, we even have indications of how the moves fit to the music. The description of the move is in columns. The columns line up under the A or B music. And these little markers within the text indicate the relationship to each strain or phrase of the music. So the way that I write out dances today has some links going back hundreds of years to the way that John Playford originally laid things out when he published that first collection of English country dances. Now Playford can be pretty obscure and hard to interpret, but the same could probably be said of my cards. It's partly this that leads people to think that Playford's publication was intended as an aid memoir for people who already knew the dances and didn't need to have every detail explained. Think about all the things that are left out in Playford and in our modern notation. We don't give detailed explanations of the moves. It just says do si do or siding. And what would that mean to somebody who was just picking this up and reading it for the first time? They don't tell you how to move your arms and your feet. They don't tell you what steps to use and how they fit to the music. So that goes back to what I was saying about the way you notate things depends on what you're trying to achieve and who your audience is. What I've shown you and what I've been describing isn't the only approach to doing dance notation. Historically, some dancing masters used diagrams rather than words. This particular example is from Lorin's Livre de Contredance from about 1685. Lorin was sent to England by the French king to collect English country dances, and he wrote them down in diagrams, some of the same ones we have notated in words from the Playford collections. Or there's the more modern Laban notation which gives you a much more complete picture of how you're moving. These diagrammatic notations can tell you more about the movement relative to the other dancers and the way that you hold and move your body. But I'd have a challenge reading those diagrams at speed on stage while calling a dance. Let me show you this as another example of notation. This is Larry Jennings' book, Zesty Contras, and I'm going to uh, select, fairly much at random, number 188, which is Dandy's Hornpipe. Now, Larry's done an extremely terse version of notation. He even has special codes. That code 8CI says that it's eight parts to the dance, the part count, which um, gives you a measure of the complexity. The C means that it's significantly unequal. The ones get to do almost everything. And the I means that short sets are preferable when doing this. The daggers in the middle of the text mark particularly complicated bits. And rather than writing it out in terms of A1 and A2 and bar counts, Larry divides it up into four bar sections. So in this case, one and two correspond to the A1 music, all eight bars of it. Three is bars one to four of A2 and so on. You may also find people who count the number of steps or beats 
rather than bars. If you were notating clog dances or rapper dances or Romanian dances, something different may be appropriate. But what I've shown you works pretty well for formation based dances of the types that I'm mainly interested in. The rest of this is really aimed at people who are interested in calling. If that applies to you, then I'd recommend that you write out your own dance cards. It's a major investment of time, but the mere process of writing a dance out helps you analyse, understand and remember it. Write it out in a way and using words that make sense to you. Remember that the objective is to give you a quick reminder of the dance. Just because I've chosen to do something one way does not necessarily mean that it will make sense to you. There are alternatives to using cards uh, like these index cards. You'll find some people with books of dances. When I started calling, there really wasn't an alternative to writing out physical notes, but there are now. You'll find some first rate callers who've decided to switch to electronic media and you'll see them on stage with laptops or tablets. But the notation on those systems will probably be fundamentally the same as what I've written down and I've shown you today. Personally, I've taken a conscious decision to continue using cards. Don't get me wrong, I have all my cards scanned in and stored electronically. It's available to me on my phone, on my laptop, on my tablet and anywhere else that I can get a browser connection. That's a very useful backup. Ask any caller with a large collection of cards and all the time invested in those about how important it is to have a backup. I know some people who've left their cards in a restaurant and gone frantic over it. Um, there's also people who may have encountered the uh, dancer with the glass of beer that's getting dangerously close to their call box. I have a card that got rained on. It reminds me every time I look at it how wet it was the first evening I called that dance. Having the electronic version is also a very handy way of being able to call something if I'm attending an event and get asked to do something off the cuff and I haven't carried hundreds of bits of paper around with me. But cards do have some advantages too. It's one less bit of technology to go wrong. Their batteries don't run out. The screens don't go blank or lock partway through a dance. I also use the cards as a way of physically organizing an event. I tend to turn up at an event with a selection of dances that I expect to do and the cards dug out of my call box and ready to use but I select which dances to do and I adapt the order during the evening as I see how the evening feels to me. It's easy to have piles of cards for different formations, different styles or difficulties, and then to pick out individual cards and shuffle them into an order. They also fit very unobtrusively onto a clip that I had made that attaches to my microphone stand so I can just look down briefly and scoop up some of the words from the card and use them. Again, do what works for you. Try some different ways of doing it. Pick a medium that works for you. Don't be worried about having call cards and taking them on stage. I've heard some people comment that you really should not need them. You should know the dances. I just don't buy that. I never have. I do my homework. I go through all my cards before every dance. I do have them fresh in my memory. It may not take me more than a brief glance at a card as I'm working through the evening, but I do want those cards there. They can be a useful reminder when your mind goes blank and virtually everybody's mind does at some point. Or if you've got a little hiccup and you think, which order did those moves come in? It's something like that. The cards are there as a backstop. As far as I'm concerned, my objective is to give dancers the best experience possible, not to look smart by showing off how good my memory is. That said, don't be too dependent on your cards. If you are literally reading off the card, then you're going to give a very wooden performance. So now a thought on organising your cards. Personally, I order my cards alphabetically, straight through A to Z. 
I've discovered that I can remember titles of dances and the characteristics and put them together. When I first started dancing, I couldn't remember any dance titles. But once I started calling and I had the dances in front of me in a visual form, that ability to link the title to the dance developed. Consequently, I find it easiest for me to keep my large collection of cards organised by name. But some other people I know organise by dance style, separating out English from contras and then sorting alphabetically within those categories. Others like to divide by formation. And some people I know use different colour cards for different formations or different styles. Again, experiment a little and do what works for you. What helps you organise your repertoire and find the information you want quickly and painlessly? Lastly, a thought on expanding your repertoire. Find what dances you like. An increasing number of dances are available online. There are still books published with dances in them. But one of the best ways is to collect dances that you have enjoyed dancing. Don't be afraid to go up to a caller and ask if you can borrow and copy their card. I've done that a lot and almost all callers will be very happy to share with you. After all, that's the way a lot of them will have gained a lot of their repertoire. These days, with good phones on cameras, it will only take you a moment to snap a photo of the card. There are three things that I'd advise though. Firstly, write out the dance in your own way. Secondly, give credit to the person you got the dance from, as well as the original author. And finally, always, always make sure that you return the card to them. So that's it for this online workshop. I hope you found it to be of interest and I look forward to dancing with you at some point. Goodbye.